Today, I'm gonna to be using this to find out how radioactive my neighborhood is. This is a Geiger Muller counter, and radiation workers use these to see how radioactive the area they're working in is. A Geiger Muller counter, or GM counter, is... is a sonification. And, in fact, it was one of the first uses of sonification. You know those videos that say something like, what does space sound like? Unless it's a location with an atmosphere, which most of them are not, it's usually just a way to represent the data using sound rather than something else like visual data. The way a Geiger counter works is actually pretty interesting, but that's not the focus of this video, so I'm gonna leave that with you as homework. The unit of measurement for a Geiger counter and radiation exposure is microsieverts per hour. Now, when we're measuring radiation, we need to be aware of the background radiation that we're all experiencing at every second of the day, which is a combination of cosmic rays and the radiation from everything around us, including our own bodies. So we're trying to measure the radiation of a particular object and its radiation is very low, the signal is probably going to be dominated by the background radiation. Your level of background radiation will depend on where you are. It will be determined by the local geology and other objects in your vicinity. One general trend is the closer you are to sea level, the less radiation you'll be exposed to because there's more atmosphere to block the cosmic rays. The biggest source of background radiation is radon gas, which comes from the decay of uranium in the soil. Radon gas is in the air, so anytime you take a breath, you have radioactive gas in your lungs, but it shouldn't be enough to concern you. So I came to this area because there's a lot of grass and soil, and I wondered whether the radon gas coming from the ground would be enough to increase the background radiation relative to the streets where we just were earlier. So the answer is a little bit, maybe. The background radiation back on the streets was anywhere from about 0.06 to 0.12 microsieverts per hour. Um, here, it's about anywhere from 0.14 to 0.15 microsieverts per hour. So maybe a little increase, uh, hard to say. It also depends on what's actually under the soil because if we've got just like some kind of concrete under the soil, that's gonna be blocking any of the radon gas that's coming from deeper, from uranium in the rocks further down. Whereas if we were more perhaps in the country, uh, it'd be more likely that the, uh, the gas from the rocks underneath us can rise up from the rocks, get through the soil and get into the air. If you live in Australia, you can use this tool to see how much radon is in your area. So we've talked about background radiation, but let's wander around a little bit and see if we can find some specific objects or places that have a higher radiation than the background level. Come with me. All right, I found some rocks here. Let's have a look and see if these are any more radioactive than the background radiation. So at the moment, you can see the top, uh, top section is the real time amount of uh, radiation in microsieverts per hour. It's about 0 0.11, 0 0.10 maybe. Um, seems to be going down for some reason, but that's a little bit lower than the background radiation of the grass where we were just were, which is interesting. Um, we can try some of the other rocks, um, but it seems like uh, this is gonna be a resounding no, not radioactive. These would be radioactive if they had any trace amounts of uranium or any other uh, radioactive materials in here, um, but it doesn't seem like these rocks do. So now that we're back on the street, we're back to around 0 0.10, 0 0.11 microsieverts per hour. But let's see if we can find something a little bit more interesting. Other minor sources of radiation in our environment include granite bench tops, bananas, soil, potatoes, kitty litter made of clay or bentonite, Brazil nuts, beer, radioactive smoke detectors, fluorescent lights, some ceramics, some recycled metals such as cheese graters, and exit signs. So. Let's investigate some of these. All right, this will be interesting. So some exit signs actually have some radioactive material in them because they're legally required to stay lit at all times, even during an emergency. So if the power cuts out and somehow their, uh, their battery cuts out, then they have, to stay, they have to stay somewhat visible. And they do that by glowing. And part of that often is with some kind of radioactive material. So let's have a look. Um, see if we have any increase. We're at 0.12 microsieverts per hour here. As we get closer, Let's see, some small increase. Okay, we're up to 0.16. Maybe a little bit closer maybe, 0.17. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. One thing I wasn't sure about when I bought this was how well a cheap GM counter would actually uh, measure these low amounts of radiation of the background radiation in everyday objects. But overall, I'm pretty happy with how it's doing. So let's head home and see what kind of household objects are radioactive as well. All right, so. Here we are in the kitchen. The uh, ambient uh, real-time uh, radiation is about 0.12 microsieverts per 
hour. Let's, uh, let's test a couple of things that are known to be a little bit radioactive. First is a banana. First, we'll see what it looks like without, um, without the peel off. Uh, funnily enough, it's not actually going up. So bananas, as it turns out, not that radioactive maybe, but let's see what happens if we take the peel off. All right, so it's cre crept up to about 0.16. It was 0 0.20 just before. Um, now it's gone back down to 0 0.14. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, but we can probably conclude that bananas are not that radioactive. Um, but let's try Brazil nuts, which uh, rumor says are radioactive. I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat, we're gonna eat these after, don't worry. Yes, let's get a close up shot of that. Uh, 0 0.14, 0 0.13, yep, not that radioactive. I mean, both of them are slightly higher than what the ambient radio radiation was in the kitchen. So uh, maybe there's something happening there, but not that radioactive. You don't have to worry about eating bananas or uh, Brazil nuts anytime soon. This has all been very fun, but how much radiation do you actually need for something to be considered dangerous? That depends on its radioactivity, but also how long you're exposed for and how many times you're exposed to it. If you're exposed to a high amount of radiation for a minute, that could be less bad than being exposed to a medium amount of radiation for an hour or two. One to two million microsieverts over a short period will give you nausea and fatigue, while over a longer period, it will increase your chances of getting cancer. Two to three million will cause nausea and vomiting within 24 to 48 hours. The International Commission on Radiological Protection recommends the maximum exposure on top of natural background radiation for radiation workers is 100 millisieverts, averaged over five years and one millisievert per year for members of the general public. The Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency have produced this table for the dosage rates required for different health effects. So the question is, how much radiation have I actually been exposed to while filming this video? So Sydney is not that radioactive, and for the most part, I've just been exposed to the same background radiation, mostly from radon, that I'm always exposed to. Australia has low levels of background radiation, with my local area being amongst the lowest on average, at five BQ per meter cubed, or Becquerel per cubic meter, the International Atomic Energy Agency outlines a maximum reference level of 300 BQ per meter cubed for homes and 1000 BQ per meters cubed for workplaces. For most people, the amount of natural radiation that they receive is significantly higher than the amount of artificial radiation. Not that natural radiation is somehow better for you, of course, but artificial radiation sources are just not a problem for the average person. The Kerala coast in India has one of the highest levels of natural background radiation at 12.5 millisieverts due to its thorium containing monazite sands. Now you might be wondering then, does living in Kerala increase your chances of getting cancer? It's a good question, but the answer seems to be probably not. A massive study followed people living in Kerala for over 10 years and found no evidence of excess cancer risk from exposure to terrestrial gamma radiation. What about places that nuclear bombs have been used? You might be wondering whether there's any risk to visiting or living in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Well, the radiation in those cities are on par today with natural background radiation. In fact, within a week, the radiation from the bombs would have decreased by a factor of 1 million. So if you're not a radiation worker, radiation is probably not something you have to worry about unless you're like me and worry about nuclear war a lot. Before we wrap up, I'd like to make an announcement. I've received a grant from EA Funds to support this channel and to make science and ethics communications videos. I'm really, really grateful for this and it will allow me to spend more money on increasing my production value, but it will also allow me to be paid for my time. This is just the start folks, and it's really great to have you on board. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to let YouTube know by subscribing, liking, and leaving a comment. That's it, bye. Oh, that's interesting, come check this out. So I saw this, these tiles, and I was wondering what that was, and... It's gone down now, <laughs> it's gone down. Never mind. <laughs> Hello? <laughs>